Howdy, howdy, friends and neighbors. This is your old pal B coming to you from the far side with that dash of Indotech's flavor. Salamat datang di Radio Far Side, langsung dari hutan. Welcome to another thought-provoking installment of Radio Far Side. Why is humanity obsessed with the number three? Where does the concept of Trinity come from? How did the universe begin? And what does it all have to do with banking? Stay tuned. A few housekeeping notes. You can find us at Radio Farside on Twitter, Radio Farside on YouTube and Facebook, and Algenguy.com for the blog site and other goodies. The Farside store will launch soon with the finest arts and handcrafts from Java, including Wayang, Batik Tulis, wood carving, brass, monel, anklung, chonklak, and fine arts selected by our award-winning curator. If you appreciate quality and uniqueness, then you will want to shop with us. In this installment of Radio Farside, we talk with the incomparable Joseph P. Farrell, Oxford Doctor of Patristics and one of the leading writers and researchers in alternative history and science. Dr. Farrell joins us from his home in South Dakota, USA to discuss his concept of the topological metaphor and his profound influence on the development of civilizations past and present. Please join us in welcoming our guest, Dr. Joseph P. Farrell. Joseph, welcome back to Radio Farside. It's really great to talk to you again. Thank you for having me back, Bernard. Well, uh, you know, the last time we spoke uh, was with Scott DeHart as well, and we talked about transhumanism, and that, that interview turned out to be one of the most popular we've ever done here. Oh, wow. uh, it's gotten, oh, I think close to 2,000 hits just on YouTube and then Vimeo and the website as well. So uh, people are very interested in what you have to say, I think. Uh, and that shows, too, in your popularity, which uh, continues to grow across the world, from what I can tell. Well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I could use the royalties on flip sales. Yeah. Uh, well, understood, understood. Well, for this interview, what I was thinking of doing is, is launching with uh, uh, a concept that, that I've picked up out of your writings. It seems to be... Uh, kind of a string that ties everything together, and it's something you call the topological metaphor. Um, and and I relate that to similar concepts of Trinity and uh, Richard Casares' triptychs and this this whole idea of threes. Um, and I, I wanted to, to take off with a, a little anecdote from my days as a Benedictine monk. I, I had grappled with... Uh, of how to understand the idea of Trinity, of uh, right. three co-equal beings or entities uh, that were both separate and uh, completely one. Right. And one day I was picking up eggs out of the hen house, and I had this this flash, and I ran down to the abbot's cell, and, and I said, Abbot, Abbot, I think I understand the Trinity now. I said, the Father is the mind, the Son is the body, and the Spirit is the soul. And they, they're separate entities, but they all exist in one being. And he smiled at me and he said, yes, you're absolutely right, but that's a heresy. <laughs> well, it's interesting that you, that you mentioned that kind of um, analogy, because that, of course, comes more or less uh, directly from St. Augustine. Mm. Uh, St. Augustine of Hippo, who came up with, with what are called in, in theological parlance the psychological analogies of the Trinity, in which the faculties of the soul, mind, uh, memory, and will, or in some cases emotion or what have you, are analogs of the three persons of the Trinity. Um, it's interesting that the West, Western theology, Roman Catholicism, Protestantism, and so on, are very Augustinian in that sense, in that if one says the terms analogies of the Trinity, one tends to think almost as a kind of subconscious cultural reflex that the analogies are psychological. Right. But if you turn... If you turn to Eastern Orthodoxy, which is is very much the the um, tradition that I come from and that I would identify with if I were back in my ecclesiastical days, 
uh, within Orthodoxy, the Cappadocian Fathers, uh, St. Basil the Great, um, St. Gregory the, of Nazianzus, or sometimes he's called St. Gregory the Divine or St. Gregory the Theologian, right. and then uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa. When you look at those uh, three persons, they come up with a very different type of analogy, and for want of a better expression, it would be called the sociological analogy. In other words, if you're going to if you're going to think of God as uh, three persons united totally uh, and indivisibly in one nature, then humanity itself becomes an analogy of God because every human being shares a common nature, uh, a common soul, certain faculties that are all in common, and yet. Uh, each individual person is an absolutely irreducibly unique instantiation of that. Mm -hmm. So they have you look not within, but rather outside of yourself in order to perceive the analogy. So there's two very, very different approaches. Uh, and of course, like all analogies, they, <laughs> they ultimately break down. Right. But, well, and, and also I've gathered, uh, at least in the Western Christian tradition, starting about 300 A.D., there, there seems to be a move of externalizing God and making humans as, as some kind of inferior thing that can right. never achieve the, the divine um, without some well, kind that, of, of grace. That's that, Yeah, without grace, but it's actually, uh, again, not strictly speaking true because if you look at the um, liturgical texts the old uh, the old Latin mass and and then of course the the liturgy of st. John Chrysostom in, in the mm -hmm. Eastern Church it's very very clear that as far as the ancient um, Catholic patristic tradition was concerned you had the idea of salvation precisely as deification. In other words, you partook of, um, through Christ, you partook of all of the divine operations. You partook of immortality. You partook of, to a certain extent, a limitless growth in, in grace and so on and so forth. So it was viewed not so much as um, as a salvation from sin, but rather a salvation to becoming divine. Uh, uh, so that's you know these these texts are clearly there in in the old uh, in the old rituals, both east and west, and, and they're still there. They're still present to a great extent within the Eastern Church. Well, especially in the creeds, I think. Yeah. Oh yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Well, coming back around to the topological metaphor, that right. this has been a really intriguing idea that that I've gotten from your writings. Um, first of all, you know, topology is is describing the surface of something, the tensions or the slack on it. Uh, right. It's it's a mathematical process, right. um, and then making it a metaphor, you're obviously trying to uh, relate something known to something unknown. So right. if, if you could kind of describe for us what a topological metaphor is. Well, in in my thinking, this, this requires setting it up a bit, um, Bernard. Um, when, I, when I started years and years ago, um, my study of theology, I quickly came to the conclusion that, first of all, theology was getting very short shrift mm. from the so-called scientific and, and philosophical community because they fundamentally misunderstood the nature of theological language. Mm. And if you, if you look at the, again, if you look at the Christian patristic tradition, uh, and this, this is particularly true of, of the Eastern expression of it, uh, if you look at it, one of the things that is, you are constantly reminded is that the the terms, the technical terms or jargon of, of dogmatic theology is a symbolic language. And I took that in, in quite the literal mathematical sense that there are resemblances, very strong ones, palpable ones, between the language of theology in that sense, 
and the language of mathematics and even to a certain extent um, the use of applied mathematics within physics. Mm -hmm. So right around 1982-1983 as I was finishing my master's degree I, I had been um, at the time studying at, at St. Vladimir's Seminary, Eastern Orthodox Seminary in, in New York City with a very well-known, internationally known uh, Orthodox theologian by the name of Father John Meyendorf. Mm -hmm. And I was assigned a paper, the class was assigned a paper from him dealing with certain topics in, in Trinitarian dogmatic theology. And I asked him if I could do my paper on mathematical methods in theology. Mm -hmm. And he asked me what I meant. So I went to the board and I put the, there's a famous definition, as you know, within Christian theology of the, the doctrine of the incarnation that was formulated at, at the Fourth Ecumenical Council of Chalcedon right. in 451. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I, I had reduced the language of, of that definition, which talks about um, operations, two natures, one person, and so on. So you have three categories of thought here, person, uh, operations, and then nature. And each one of them, if you stop and think about it, are dealing with different kinds of infinities. So we're already in kind of a quasi-mathematical world. So what I had done is I had taken this definition and reduced it to a kind of mathematical symbolization, which I wrote on the blackboard. And, and Father Meyendorf's reaction was, was very telling to me because he, he was sitting there <laughs> watching me do this with this look of, uh, I don't know, it was a mixture of abject horror. <laughs> <laughs> and at the same time, fascination. Uh, anybody that remembers Father John would, will know the kind of expression that, <laughs> that crossed his face as I was doing this. He was, he was, he was quite a character. But anyway, he, when I got done, he he held his hands out in front of his his face, you know, with his palms up toward me, and shook his palms, his hands back and forth, and he says. No, no, no. <laughs> never, <laughs> never, never talk to me about this again. <laughs> that would actually kind of be my reaction. To, yeah, well, I'm not really fun said, with math. Yeah, well, he said, uh, he said, go ahead and do your paper, but he said, never, <laughs> never talk to me about this again. So, you know, I, I continued to play with this idea of, um, I, at the time, and I still in some cases call this this whole attempt of mine to symbolize these types of metaphysical concepts in a workable, formally explicit type of mathematical symbolization, and a kind of a formally explicit calculus, if you will. Um, I called it analogical calculus, and I still sometimes refer to it that way. But in in doing this, I came across what I've been calling also the topological metaphor of the medium, mm -hmm. which is very, uh, it's much simpler to, to diagram, and unfortunately I don't have a way of doing that, but I'll try and, and give people the basic idea of what's going on, and then show what I think, in my opinion, it it manifests in terms of various types of philosophical systems and, and uh, philosophical um, explorations of, of metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And that is, if you start with the idea of nothing, okay, imagine, in other words, an infinitely extended sea of sameness in all directions. Mm -hmm. And because of this, you cannot qualify it by any sort of... Um, attributional language. There, it is a true and proper nothing, since there are no distinctions in it. You cannot, you know, you can't say anything more about it. Now, interestingly enough, as you know, uh, having been a Benedictine, this type of language is the language that medieval theologians in both the East and the West used not only of God, but here's the kicker. They used it of space, okay, right. in, in in the in the classic physics sense. Mm 
And this caused a conundrum, particularly in the medieval West, because if you're using the same type of language, uh, you know, non-attributional, infinitely extended, uh, no differentiation, etc., etc., then this meant, first of all, that you had the problem of you were describing God in the same language that you were describing physical things mm -hmm. that uh, natural scientists were involved with. So I, I thought, well, gee, this is very peculiar. And then let's now do something else. Let's play a mathematical game. Let's, let's define a function and we'll call it hyperdifferentiation. And by defining this function, we're also going to assume, for the sake of uh, a given in the mathematical sense, that this function allows you to make distinctions within that nothing by any means whatsoever. Okay? Okay. Now, once you've done that, then what you've done is you've cleaved the nothing, all right? And now what do you have? Well, you've got three nothings because in, in the topological sense of, of mathematics, you've got one region of nothing, you've got another region of nothing, and then you have the common surface between the two, which is in its own right a third nothing. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, is this so like now, is this like uh, empty sets or or? Yeah. This. You okay. Know, this is, yeah. That's precisely the the symbolism that I use uh, in my books to um, denote this nothing, and then it's three differentiations, which in uh, a common surface in, in topology is is signified by the partial differential symbol, which uh, mm -hmm. those those who are familiar with mathematics will know what that symbol is. Mm -hmm. So um, you end up with three nothings. But what the, is really interesting here is at at the instant that you apply this function to that initial nothing, you end up creating number. All right, mm -hmm. and the other thing that you've done is you've added information to the system, but in each case, what you have is a signature of nothing that remains that that hyperset uh, symbol that remains in the description of each of those three entities. So what also is beginning to happen is you have an analogical similarity between these three entities because of the presence of that symbolization. So in other words, you also have the beginnings of a, uh, a way to describe analogical thought processes themselves because it's written into this metaphor. Mm -hmm. Now, let's, let's go for a moment to something else that I began to uh, think about. And, you're quite right to notice that this metaphor really underwrites all of my books. In fact, it makes its first appearance in the fourth book that I wrote, which is The Giza Death Star Destroyed. Destroyed right. that's, that's the first time I openly published a part of my private notes about this, um, what I've been calling the topological metaphor. So it's it's underpinned all of my books because, as I've said, people ask me all the time, Bernard, how do you connect dots so well? Mm -hmm. Well, o over the course of, of experimenting, you know, for the last 30 years <laughs> in trying to create this analogical calculus, I've learned a lot of very specific things about the way analogies function. Uh, this, this formal system allows you to see the difference between apt and inept analogy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I use this very deliberately in, in constructing my books and, and laying them out in the particular order that they're laid out in. Um, but anyway, the thing that I began to notice was if you took this system and then applied it to metaphysical texts of any sort, be they Neoplatonism or the Platonists or the Aristotelians or even you know you can you can apply it to uh, basic Hindu conceptions you can right. apply it to uh, the Mayan cosmology in other words once you learn how to strip away uh, 
what a remote viewer would call the analytical overlay and look simply at the concepts and the structures, what, what happens to pop out of all of this is that the metaphor underlies most of these informally explicit systems of metaphysics. And right. that to me was, that to me was a huge revelation. And to kind of, uh, to kind of summarize, uh, yet another thing that I bumped into, uh, you mentioned my co-author, uh, Dr. Scott DeHart, that uh, helped me write our book, Transhumanism. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, you know, the metaphor appears there in a, in a hugely uh, big way. Right. But um, we began to get, this is very interesting, we began to get a lot of emails from people that were reading the book asking us questions about it. So we decided to do a kind of uh, Cliff Notes response to some of these email questions. And we put it out in a little book on Lulu called Transhumanism in Dialogue. And one of the questions that we were asked was precisely about this topological metaphor. And in that book, we pointed out something very interesting because I had been reading, uh, continuing to read um, about this subject. And Bernard, I ran across three quotations from three of the most famous mathemat mathematicians in Western history. And I mean, you know, we, we would not have the civilization and technology we have today without these three mathematicians mm. and what they did. And the first quotation was that I ran into and that we put in this little book was from Rene Descartes. <laughs> okay, you know, well, inventor of you know, inventor of Cartesian coordinate system and analytical geometry and linear algebra and you know all, and all that other stuff that high school students all that hate. Other stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and what he said is he noticed that in his reading of the ancient mathematicians, the ancient geometers, he came across evidence of what he thought was a system of analysis which allowed them to solve all sorts of problems which we did not yet know and which he thought had been deliberately suppressed. Mm -hmm. And I thought, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's then, very curious. Yeah, that's that is a real whopper. And then I I ran into Newton saying the same thing that he thought in his reading of of the ancient geometers that he found a system of analysis that again he thought had been deliberately suppressed. Wow. And the real kicker for me was, you know, one of my favorite fellows, and in fact, my favorite fellow in that little trinity of mathematicians, Gottfried Leibniz. Leibniz, yeah. Yeah, you know, Gottfried Leibniz was just this <laughs> mad genius. <laughs> <laughs> truly mad and truly a genius. Yeah, truly mad. <laughs> you know, uh, writing in just so many areas and writing well. You know, he, along with Newton, invented the, the integral and differential calculus. Uh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. still, you know, and Leibniz was very... Leibniz was an extraordinary man because he appreciated that not only did one have to have the right technique, one had to have the right symbolization of it. So he devoted much of his mathematical study to coming up with apt symbols of what he was talking about. Huh. So in other words, in spite of the fact that Newton chronologically beat Leibniz to the punch in, in the discovery of the calculus, we use Leibniz's notation, and thank goodness that we do, because if you've seen L Newton's notation for it, it's just... It's just oh, awful. that's why Principia is so difficult. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's another reason. But anyway, uh, Leibniz came along and and said pretty much the same thing that Newton and Descartes had said, that he thought that the ancients had a technique of analysis that had either been lost or deliberately suppressed. But then he went on to say some things that were very, to me, hugely important. He said that 
this, it appears that they had, first of all, a calculus, in other words, a formally explicit symbolic algebraic type of system uh -huh. to perform this analysis. And then secondly, he also stated very explicitly that it appeared to him that this calculus had nothing to do with numbers. And thirdly, that they obtained their results by a sort of imitation of calculation. And then finally, you know, this is Leibniz after all that we're talking about. Yeah. And, and finally, he says, it appears to me that this, is, this system has been suppressed, that they knew this system and used it to analyze all of their mathematical problems. And I thought, whoa, because what it appeared to me at that point was what all three men may have been talking about is what I've been calling this, this topological metaphor of the medium, or in some cases, analogical calculus. So, you know, I, I, I was kind of dumbfounded, Bernard, because what it, what it kind of indicated to me was they were noticing the same things about ancient texts that I was noticing. Well, I mean, this is a real mind blower because one, how do you do mathematical analysis without numbers? Exactly. But I guess it, what I'm trying to imagine here is is something like word problems. Train A right. leaves the station at 6:09 a.m. and that kind of thing. Is that is that what we're right. talking about? Well, Newton mentions this. Newton mentions that, you know, the ancients disguised their analysis by verbiage. Mm. So, in other words, he was alive to the fact that they had some sort of symbolic uh, system, an algebra of sorts, to deal with these things. And But the key here for me is Leibniz, um, because Leibniz, I think, because he was not only interested in mathematics, but like many people in the early Enlightenment, he was interested in... Uh, linguistics. The thing that caught my eye when he said that they achieved that this was a calculus without numbers and they achieved their results by an imitation of calculating. The first thing I thought of was Noam Chomsky. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> because you know, if you look at Noam Chomsky's uh, transformational generative grammar, right? What you have there is precisely a a symbolic calculus that is doing formal processes but they're totally unrelated to numbers and they're not even really reducible even to a binary type of logic and if you if you go back to what we said about the topological metaphor if you look at it from the standpoint of uh, of a formal system of logic th that system is ternary rather than binary right so in other words, you're you're creating a, a kind of um, uh, an asymmet asymmetrical logic. Uh, the closest approximation to it would be the idea of, of um, superposition in in quantum mechanics and, and data information processing and so on. Yeah, where where at least some of it doesn't exist at, at some given moment. Yes, that kind uh, of thing. Well, in, in superposition, you know, if you if you notate it in binary notations, a bit of information is both a one and a, and zero, a zero, right? At the, same, at the same time, right? So, topologically speaking, what you're talking about there is a common surface. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, all of this is huge. Um, it just it still kind of boggles my mind. And there are aspects of it. I'll be very blunt and honest here. There are aspects of it I I will not and do not talk about because. Uh, they're they're very very dangerous, but um, it is none, it is nevertheless I think uh, something that it appears to me that that uh, those three mathematicians were quite correct that there was something going on that we haven't really quite clued into in some of these in some of these ancient texts. Well, I, I think that's obvious from from not only your writing but of course so many other writers that have analyzed right. the ancient texts that. That all of these things keep pouring out of it that have analogs to you know today's world, right. um, today's science. You know, I I, I think often of the uh, Buddha's metaphor about uh, reality is like sea foam. You know, it yes. bubbles up, it rides on top of the ocean, and it pops and goes back down in, and it right. and it's almost identical to quantum foam. Yes. 
Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, you have you have the idea of in, in certain um, theoretical physics conceptions of the universe being a holographic sort of system. Mm. Well, again, you know, this is very similar to the Hindu view. Uh, and on and on we could go. Um, I think the key to all of this, Bernard, is is uh, what those ancient texts and, and civilizations often tell us about themselves. They often strongly either suggest or just come right out and tell you that that their legacy civilizations of something much higher. And I think it's time, you know, that we take that very, very seriously. Well, indeed, and, and in fact, there seems to be a snowballing effect going on where, where more and more people are starting to come to this realization that there, there is some kind of precursor civilization that was global, minimal, right. minimally global. Right. Um, you know, I, uh, going back to Richard Cassar's essay on uh, triptychs, uh, he's he's noted the the use of these three doors on on sacred buildings and sacred architecture all over the world, all through time, different cultures and appearing and reappearing in different cultures. Uh, and and to get an idea, it's, it's like uh, you look at Notre Dame. And you see right. the, the large central portal and then two smaller ones on either side. Right. Uh, and that, that image, I've seen it in, in Tikal in, in Guatemala. I've seen it here. Uh, there, uh, where is it? Just here in West Java, Central Java. Uh, this, this image keeps appearing everywhere, and, and it ties in with this whole idea of threes, of trinity. Uh, right. And, and that's what got me intrigued with this this whole uh, topological metaphor is that the initial division creates three entities, three right. sets, and and how all this ties together and it's, it's it's very very interesting and exciting. But as you say, it boggles the mind. Yeah, it does. It it really does because once you uh, once you get very adept at, at playing with this, then it becomes very clear that. This is a very, very uh, powerful and potentially dangerous thing because the other thing, this is very crucial for people to understand. If, if you assume, as I think did the ancients, that this primordial nothing, which undergoes differentiation, mm -hmm. is the vehicle of creation itself, then what you're doing when you suggest that there is this signature of nothing remaining in all derivatives, you know, first order all the way down down to nth order derivatives, mm -hmm. is that what results from this is the physical medium is not only analogical in nature, but number two, it's a it's an information field. Mm. That is is transmutative in nature. In other words, here, in, in my opinion, lies the formally explicit basis for their ideas about alchemy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know, there's all sorts of ways this 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 metaphor begins to play on on the human imagination, and that's one of them. Yeah, and, and that's something that, well, I mean, it, it's like pondering infinity. You know, after a while, you, your brain just re revolts at it uh, when you get too far into it. But I wanted to ask you, with the the initial split here, we, we've got a nothingness that divides into two nothings. Now, is this the origin also of, of the, the opposites, uh, the things that can only be described by relation to their opposite? Well, to a certain extent, it is. Um, the, the dialectic of oppositions, I mean, uh, you know, the Neoplatonists made careers out of it. Yeah. <laughs> as, as, as did St. Augustine of Hippo, for that matter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, the, the dialectic of oppositions has, has in, in fact, that was, that was one of the things I spent most of my academic theological career <laughs> writing about in one form or another. But yeah, it's definitely present. Um, but there is, there is a twist to this, and it's a very subtle one. Hmm. Um, because particularly in the 
Platonic and Neoplatonic tradition, they're very, very careful, and I think once you hear what I'm about to say, you'll see why. They're very, very careful to say, and they do this repeatedly, that this initial nothing, or to use the Neoplatonic expression, the one, hmm. is good. In other words, it's the highest good. It's mm -hmm. the summum bonum. And I think what they're doing, and the reason they're doing this, is that they understand that even though there may be this kind of um, formal system behind it, you expose yourself to danger once you begin to overlay it with what, again, what a remote viewer would call analytical overlay. Uh. When, when you start ascribing moral categories to it okay and if you don't have that that initial additional assumption that this initial nothing is good then you can end up either elevating evil to its own co-equal principle uh. with the good or you can end up with systems of dualism or in yet a, in yet another manifestation of this you can end up with the idea uh, as as occurs eventually in Plotinus, as a matter of fact, you can end up with the idea that matter, as the uttermost emanation from the one, is by that very emanation evil. Okay. So, in other words, the material world becomes a manifestation of both good and evil. So there's always this mixture. So I think I think. With that qualification, yeah, you could say that the other types of dialectics of opposition that you find in these types of systems, you know, finitude versus infinity, right? Uh, corporeality versus incorporeality, uh, and so on and so forth. Once you once you start exploring it that way, with that proviso, then then you're fairly safe. Mm -hmm. Although you know we have to we have to admit that that um, during the Renaissance you have this tremendous revival of Hermeticism, and therefore, in my opinion, kind of a revival of interest in in the metaphor itself. You have people like uh, Giordano Bruno. Oh yeah, s stating that that the this primordial nothing this this primordial trinity is that in which all oppositions co-inherit you have the coincidenta oppositorum so uh, you you get this kind of uh, beginning within the history of western philosophy at this point the the possibilities of, of the philosophical explorations or even political explorations for that matter of, of absolute evil and you know that that finally bursts out in, into full force in, in the 20th century mm -hmm. so um, you know there, there are dangers with this there, and, and and like I say some of some of the dangers I don't even ever talk about well and, and that's understandable because I, I you know I can probably begin to deduce some of the things you're thinking but trying to get a handle on this thing, I guess there, there seems to be in your comments, uh, in your writings, and and those of others, uh, that there's there's two basic ways to conceive of this this uh, topological metaphor, and that is one is kind of biological, where mm -hmm. when when it splits, you have two complete equals uh, right. that. You know, are identical in every way, uh, and they make two complete holes. Whereas the other is looking at it as a pie, and every time you slice it, you you get a smaller and smaller right. piece of it, so that right. you never really have a hole. And right. and somehow this this all seems to tie into uh, various economic systems, right? Uh, and physical systems that you know, some one of them is reductive and the other is additive, right? Am, right. am I on the right um, track with that? Oh, abs absolutely. Um, there, you, you've touched on a, on a huge thing here because if you look at the metaphor as it stands in and of itself, and again, we have to we have to remember this is not a, a binary system; it's a ternary system. Mm -hmm. You not only have two uh, 
regions, but you've got the common surface between the two, which in itself is yet another infinity mm -hmm. uh, that that binds the two together. So you've actually got three entities. And the the interesting thing is, as you say, once you perceive the metaphor in this fashion and realize that in its formal description, in, in the formal description of each of these entities, you still have the presence of that initial hyperset, all right? Oh, uh, yeah. So again, there's, there's that, and there's the basis of analogy because you're tracking a common thing between different contexts, all right? Okay. The, the interesting thing that that means is that each of these three entities, resulting entities, and any further differenti differentiations you might make within them are always open systems. They're always described in terms of their relationships to the others. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, in terms of physics, this is a huge thing because physics is catching on to the fact that no system that they can come up with is ever completely isolated. Mm -hmm. There's always yeah. there's always a coupling mechanism of some sort, how, howsoever small or uh, non-significant it may be, there's always going to be this phenomenon. And in terms of finance, in terms of economy, it's as you say. If we look at that <clears throat> initial nothing and assign it a value of one, and then look at the resulting uh, <clears throat> the resulting entities after its initial differentiation, what results there is you can look at those entities in two ways. You can look at them as fractions of that one, mm -hmm. or you can look at them as whole numbers in and of themselves. So as you add more information to that system, either you keep dividing up the pie, as you say, and get ever smaller and smaller fractions, or you look at it as an additive system and get ever more and more numbers. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you know, depending on which way a culture construes the metaphor, their <clears throat> their economy is going to reflect a similar type of, of view. So in other words, the other thing that this metaphor is, is um, telling us, in my opinion, is that there is a deep huge connection between the basic type of physics or cosmology that you have and the type of financial or economic system that mm, you have. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. And one of the things that I've, I've really latched on to with this whole idea, um, and the, the other thing I was thinking too, does, does this system, the topological metaphor necessarily necessarily imply kind of a crystalline structure to the universe a, a matrix well, if you will well yes because if you if you look at it in a certain way um, if you if you uh, diagram what's happening with each successive order of derivatives you've got your your first derivative with that initial differentiation let's assume that you then differentiate each of those entities in their turn. So now you've got second order derivatives and mm -hmm. so on. And you can repeat this, this process, this process ad infinitum. Mm -hmm. And as you do, you're, you're constantly adding information to the system. Well, if, if that's the case, and I forgot what your original question was, <laughs> as I'm rambling here. Well, just, uh, by, by, by dividing these, these, um, entities, Again and again, does that imply that the universe itself has a has a crystalline or, right. or matrix structure? Well, if you if you're diagramming the, these derivatives, the, these orders of derivatives, what you're going to end up with is a huge uh, branching tree diagram. Although it's very important to understand, you know, here we're back to topology again. Mm -hmm. This is this is all taking place n dimensionally. So, in other words. Um, you can't think of this in terms of a two-dimensional cellular structure. Right. Uh, you have to think of it in a multi-dimensional way with lateral connections between each of these derivatives as well as vertical uh, connections between them. 
So this is a hugely uh, multi-dimensional thing. But what this is telling us then is that at each branching node in this system, what you in effect are describing is a crystalline structure. Mm -hmm. And one that, depending on how you do this, how you apply each uh, level of differentiation, it can be either periodic or aperiodic. So yeah, you, you, you can have, mm. uh, you can have both types of crystals <laughs> yeah. if you want to. Well, and, and actually this seems to me that, that, how do I explain this? Um, Einsteinian relativity implies that mass warps space time. Right. Uh, but another way to look at it using your metaphor is that space time warps and creates mass. Right. Now, right. Am, am I onto something there or just completely? Oh, nuts? yeah. I think, you know, I think, um, I think you are. Let's illustrate. Let's illustrate it by by pointing out a conundrum within quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, you have, of course, in, in the standard model, you have hadrons, leptons. You know all of these th things in the ever multiplying family tree of particles. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, you get if you look at hadrons, they're supposedly you know if you if you follow Murray Gell-Mann's uh, insight here, they're composed in their turn of quarks, and in in the case of protons and neutrons, interestingly enough, three quarks each. Okay. Right. Yeah. 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 I never thought about that. So, one. Yeah, we're you know we're right back to threes again. Uh huh. Um, and interestingly enough, Murray Gell-Mann. Um, when he's describing the charges of quarks, gives them fractional charges. You know, now who's ever heard of such a thing? What the heck is a fractional charge? Yeah. Well, this indicates the the, to my mind, the artificiality of of quantum mechanics in a certain sense. Because what's a proton? Well, it's it's uh, if I recall correctly, it's two up quarks with with a fractional charge of two-thirds and one down quark with a fractional charge of a minus third. Minus third, right. So so you add two-thirds plus two-thirds minus one-third and you get one. So it's got, you know, it has conveniently enough, <laughs> it has it has the charge of, of one. And then voila, you've got your proton. <laughs> so, and then, you know, a neutron, well, it's composed of, of two down quarks with the charge of a negative third plus an up quark with the charge of positive two-thirds, which adds up to zero, zero. and you've got a neutron. <laughs> so, you know, um, so you look at these things, and, and increasingly you, you come to the realization that, that what quantum physicists, what particle physicists are playing around with in their big machines are nothing but mathematical descriptions of information. In other words, uh, you yeah. know, we're not even we're not even really dealing with little tiny billiard balls. We're <laughs> we're dealing with packets of information. Well, the the problem here is the conundrum is is they're doing all of this in the context of a theory which has yet really to come up with a good explanation of mass. Right. And of course, you know, you've got Higgs and, and the Higgs boson and so forth. Which again are are popping out as mathematical artifacts of the system. So, the real problem is how do you account for mass? And it would appear that mass is the result, rather than the cause, mm. of these of these higher dimensional mathematical descriptions. And let me let me toss in um, a third uh, curveball, a third whopper here. And that is, I'm fascinated with, with the thinking and, and work of Gabriel Crone. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, this tremendously brilliant, uh, genius electrical engineer that, that came to this country from Hungary and eventually ended up working most of his life for General Electric in, mm -hmm. in Schenectady, New York. And Crone, interestingly enough, came up toward the end of his life he began thinking of the universe in terms of a great big huge crystal uh -huh. uh, and more interestingly to me is that he realized that all electrical machines of any nature whatsoever were first of all 
networks of simple electrical machines and that every electrical machine, every specific electrical machine that mankind could construct were manifestations of a generalized electrical machine <laughs> and that you could convert that generalized electrical machine into any particular electrical machine by the process of, of tensor analysis through tensor calculus. <laughs> now, and, and as the final whopper, what that meant was that every electrical machine was itself a network of hyperdimensional spaces. Uh. Because, yeah, because you see, in, in describing the transformations of one machine into another through tensor calculus, you have to use multidimensional mathematical techniques to do this. Oh, man. So, in other words, you know, what pops out, <laughs> what pops out at the end of all of this, is you get the idea of, of any any electrical ma machine, no matter how simple it is, is a manifestation of hyperdimensional spaces <laughs> in, wow. in, in three dimensions. So yeah, wow, you know. So, <laughs> although I mean, you just blew my mind. This is way too early for that. <laughs> but it makes sense because you've got a rotating uh, uh, device inside of a magnet. You're, you're basically creating torsion. That's what it is. Yes, exactly, exactly. Wow. So you know this this plays out in so many ways. But I think you know, given given what I've uh, read, I, I recently acquired in the last few months uh, a couple of books, one by Crone himself, and then another uh, book of uh, papers of people uh, commenting on his work mm -hmm. and. Uh, the it's it's extremely interesting to me to read these things because it boils down to the fact that this man toward the end of his life was thinking precisely along these terms and I'm willing to bet just you know on the basis of of um, intuition that he was probably thinking along some sort of lines similar to to this idea of, of the topological metaphor of the medium he had to have been uh, to come up with some of the ideas he was coming up with well and, and actually related to that would seem to be Maxwell's quaternions yes. that, that create basically a cell structure uh, right. based on on you know vectors running in all directions around them right I mean this, this whole thing just starts all of a sudden starts collapsing into into something almost almost thinkable <laughs> yeah it is and and interestingly enough the other thing that we need to remember here uh, Bernard is if you look at um, the the tradition of Kabbalah mm. you definitely have within that body of doctrine you have two very interesting things you've got the idea that the universe is a crystal mm -hmm. and you also have the idea that God created the universe by combinations of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So what's that telling you? Yeah. If you strip away the analytical overlay, what it's telling you is that every distinct thing that is created by whatever process is really nothing but a combination of information, of sets of information. Wow. So again, you know, these these ideas are very very old. I think what's what's happening is is our mathematics is beginning to catch up with them. So as as it catches up, gradually the, the language of philosophical metaphysics, which is analytical overlay, begins to fall away. <clears throat> but you're still dealing ultimately, you know, like it or not, this is bad news for the atheists in the crowd. Mm -hmm. You're still dealing with the same system. And, you know, it, this is the other thing about the metaphor, and, and again, um, Dr. DeHart and I pointed this out in, in yet another one of our books that we co-authored, is if you look at this primordial nothing, there is an inherent dialectic set up right at the outset, if you consider it carefully, because this first differentiation is it a random act or is it an act of reason uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. because there is no prior reason to this primordial nothing it's both 
So in other words, you can look at this system, so to speak, quote unquote, atheistically and say, well, this is an example of a random self-organizing system. Uh -huh. Or you can look at it theistically and say, yes, but the whole thing is observer dependent. <laughs> You know, oh man! That's, yeah, you see, in, the, in other words, I tell people all the time, Bernard, that that once you understand the implications of this metaphor, it's an acid drip. Oh yes. On all on all systems of philosophical metaphysics, from everything from Hinduism to to modern Western uh, atheistic materialism and what have you, because the the metaphor. The dialectic in the metaphor is a both and dialectic. It's not an either or dialectic. So fundamentally, it is not a dialectic of oppositions. <laughs> so, wow. You know, it, it just goes on and on and on. Well, it, it, I guess the you know the alchemist dream of of transhumanism of rising back up through the the hierarchy and uh, achieving right. the the androgyne at the beginning. Uh, right. Basically, they're trying to get back to this this primordial nothing. Is that what's happening? I think it's a little. Yeah, I think in a certain sense, um, I think that that's at least part of the effort. Um, but it's uh, it's an effort undertaken by, and any language I use here is going to sound. Um, presumptuous on my part mm -hmm. but it's it's an effort being undertaken by people that really don't understand mm -hmm. what's going on uh, because the other thing about this metaphor is that once information is introduced into the system there's a certain temporal vector that emerges from it you know Hans Reichenbach's uh, old thinking about that on, on a cosmological scale right um, so it becomes difficult to reverse that vector of time within the overall system it's not impossible in my opinion to reverse the the temporal vector in a certain portion of the system there's a difference mm -hmm. but um, <clears throat> the other thing here is that I think there are those in the know, so to speak, within people that are thinking about these types of things that are less interested in reascending back up to that primordial androgyne. We should probably say something about that here in a few minutes. But um, the that group of people, I think, realizes that if they could understand or if they knew the key that would turn the lock and enable them to manipulate the system mm -hmm. at higher order derivative levels you know first or second derivative levels of the system mm -hmm. then they would have immense power and I think that they are looking for that key um, so it's purely uh, a greed, greed thing then it's not really a, yeah, it's, it's there's not power. an ideological reason for it right yeah it's it's purely for power <clears throat> and you know I like to say I've said many times uh, when I've talked about this metaphor idea to, with various people that if you understand it and if you really grasp the significance of it, then it would allow you, if you grasped it in all of its fullness, it would allow you to take, you know, all of those uh, library shelves full of grimoires and ritual magic and, you know, uh, magical how to do it cookbooks mm -hmm. uh, and just throw them away because you'd have the key, the, the, the formally explicit grammar in the Chomskyan sense rather than these informally explicit grammars or grimoires as they're called uh, you'd have you'd have the basis of them and therefore you wouldn't need them mm -hmm. um, so I do think that there are people out there seeking this uh, 
that know that there's something fundamental that that they've been missing. An error uh, in the calculations, as it were. An error in the <laughs> equations, yeah, <laughs> so to speak. But we mentioned the androgen. We should probably talk about that. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things that Dr. DeHart and I, I think maybe we talked about this in our previous um, interview. I don't remember. It's been so long. Yeah, yeah it's uh, been a while, yeah. Uh, we ran into something very odd, um, perplexing in a way to us. And that was we were not finding the imagery that we hear so often in the New Age circle of the sacred feminine. Hmm. What we were finding was the image of the sacred androgyne, which more often than not was couched in masculine terms. And, and again, that presented a conundrum. How do you have a masculine androgen? Right. So what's going on? And we, we, we really, <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. We were pacing back and forth as we were writing that book, trying to figure out what in the name of sense is going on here. And finally, I forget which one of us it was. <clears throat> I think it was me, but you know, it's, it's hard to remember. Finally, we decided that what was most likely going on here was a process of analogical reasoning, once again. Hmm. And that if we're dealing with a high civilization, they would have known. Hello? 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 Are you there? There we are. We Uh, we lost. Yeah, not quite sure what happened there. Just a second. Mm-hmm. Um, keep the recording and pause and pause okay now <laughs> where were I we at? What, I, I remember where we were okay good um, when we were looking at this androgyne we eventually came to the conclusion that this was they were calling it a masculine androgyne because they were using a process of of analogical logic that was in turn based on their knowledge, scientific knowledge, that any mammalian male carries both sexes or is the sexual determiner of any offspring. Ah, yeah, okay. In a way that the female cannot and does not. Right. So in other words, you know, Males, by their very nature, are, in a certain sense, to their way of thinking, androgynes already, whereas a female isn't. And they simply sort of projected that imagery then to that initial nothing and called it an androgyne and and used masculine terms of it because it was producing differentiation. And that's very interesting. I, I covered this whole topic at great length in a book of mine called uh, "Grid of the Gods." Grid of the Gods, right? Yeah, where you have where you have the musical cosmology of the ancients. You know, the female is the octave mm-hmm. of you know of any fundamental note on on the keyboard, so to speak. The female would be the octave, and and the male would be all the notes in between, because again, it's it's the masculine that does the differentiating. The female can only be cloned, and so on and so forth. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, you know, the 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 parallel with modern scientific thinking is rather profound because geneticists are telling us that um, the female is the default setting <laughs> for, for yeah. humanity. You know, and, and it's the male that's that's kind of the mutation of, of that all. continues down the path a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, and what's curious, too, you know, going back to uh, uh, the Buddha, you know, the, the whole purpose of Buddhism is to achieve nirvana, which is nothing. Right. And right. and this seems to all relate to the same same concept again and again and again. Right. Well, you know, we can, we can take that, you know, the fun thing about this topological metaphor is not only does it teach you how to avoid analytical overlay, but it also invites it at one and the same time. Mm-hmm. Because it's it's rather like filling in specific values for X and Y in algebra. 
um, if you if you look at that initial empty hyperset, that initial nothing, and put the analytical overlay of personhood on it, mm -hmm. because after all, what's a person? Can can any of us define our absolute personal uniqueness in a positive way? And the answer is no. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, ultimately, we have to use what what uh, the ancients and, and Middle Ages called the via negativa, the the negative way. Right. Because ultimately, any categories of thought or any sum total of categories of thought, be they mind, will, memory, emotions, don't sum up to the uniqueness of the individual person. So if you if you look at that initial nothing in that way, as personhood itself. <laughs> <laughs> and wow. yet another interesting thing pops out because you have the idea that consciousness at some level, be it howsoever rudimentary or on the other end of the scale, howsoever preternatural or supernatural or, or you know, the intelligent bodiless powers, to use yet another expression. Right. Um, that the universe is, is suffused with consciousness. And again... That's a very uh, Eastern view. It's it's a very Christian view. Um, you know, uh, you've got a description there in a certain sense of, of the communio sanctorum, the communion yeah. of the saints. It, yeah. So in other words, on and on, on and on, this goes. You know? Well, and, and the other impression I'm getting here is is because you keep saying, well, it can be this and this, or right. you know, this uh, and but and both. Uh, it's kind of a Schrodinger's cat kind of deal here where, you know, the cat yes. in the box is both dead and alive until you look at it. Right. Once you, yes, exactly. Um, the system itself, in other words, it's, it's, it's Schrodinger's cat on a cosmological scale. Wow. Uh, you know, um, it, it's the idea of superposition on a cosmological scale. So, yeah, it's, you know, this, it's, it's a hugely fascinating topic. And uh, you know you can you can use it to analyze uh, almost anything once you understand the basic underlying fundamental uh, triadic or ternary structure of it and realize that it's an analogical structure to boot. Well, is this is this where the the three comes from? Uh, it, it seems like you know in numerology three is the number of perfection. In right. nature, you look at trees, and they always branch in threes. And you know, everywhere you look, a three keeps popping up somewhere. And, right. and is this where this is coming from? Uh, yes, I, I believe so. Yeah. There is a cause believe, and effect there. Yeah, I believe I believe uh, very definitely that that the ancients were right that that there is a fundamental threeness inbuilt into the cosmos, and this is why. Uh, because that initial that initial differentiation by the nature of the case cannot produce a two. It cannot produce a binary system mm. because you've always got that common surface that results from this. And you know, one, two, three. There you go. <laughs> so, wow. You know, it's it's very interesting to me because um, I ran into this very very early on studying theology because I believe it was um, Saint Gregory Nazianzus that said there is no middle step of two hmm. in the doctrine of the Trinity. It's one, three. There's no one, two, three. Okay? Okay. Uh, it's, it, it, it's almost as if they're saying it's one, three, two. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you find little clues like this just lying in the most unusual places, you know, Hinduism, the Mayans, <laughs> Greek, Greek church fathers. <laughs> you know. Oh, it just things um, like the third eye and the, uh, I mean, the, right. gosh, the number three just falls out of everything. You know, oh, yeah. you know, try and think of Western music without triads. Oh, yeah, you can't. There's no way. Yes. Yeah. So, you know. It <sighs> Uh-oh, I lost you again. Hello. 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 Come back. There we are. There we are. Okay, we were uh, looking at threes. Yep. Uh, well, I, I don't know where we got cut off there when the call was dropped, but um, 
I also made the comment that, you know, try and think of Western music without triads. Without the triads, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, it'd, it'd be fundamentally impossible. Uh, and again, you know, in my opinion, you know, this is another thing that I've explored in my books, is is all the way back uh, with the first book, The Giza Death Star, is I think that the modern Western system of, of musical tempering, the equal system of tempering, actually was probably a known thing to certain ancient secret societies like the Pythagoreans. Mm -hmm. um, because you see the rise within the West of, of this system of tempering after the sudden explosion of, of Hermeticism and Hermetic texts during the Renaissance. Yeah. So, you know, this to me is not an accident that that this occurs and then all of a sudden we have you know people like Palestrina and Monteverde and Heinrich Schütz and so on composing this this wonderful new sounding music uh, with all of its contrapuntal complexity yeah that you know has you know the the notes that the Beatles use are the same notes that J.S. Bach used but they're not the same notes that uh, Hildegard of Bingen used. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, no. In, in fact, when you listen to Baroque music or uh, uh, you know the the much older stuff, it, it's almost uh, it's not as pleasing as as what we would consider music now. Well, I think Baroque music is very pleasing. It, it depends on how you it depends on how you uh, temper it. But if you listen if you listen to Baroque era music and then compare it, say to the music during the high middle ages yes it is the, the music of the high middle ages won't sound quite as pleasing because of its reliance at, at, at that stage in musical history on on the natural physical ordering of the harmonic series um, what we have to remember and, and I tell people if, if you're not understanding what I'm talking about listen to the first lecture of, of Leonard Bernstein in his 1973 uh, Harvard uh, Norton Poetry Lectures where he goes through the harmonic series and explains why uh, modern Western music sounds as it does. What they did was they made a mathematical adjustment to the, the naturally occurring harmonic series mm -hmm. so that you had 12 notes on the keyboard that would allow you to use those 12 notes in any key whatsoever with all of the inbuilt harmonic relationships between fundamentals and so on and so forth without having to stop and retune the instrument. Right, you're able to I transition think, immediately without right. without an intermediate step, you know. Right, you know, and once once this is done, then you have this explosion of, of this very complex uh, very alchemical, incidentally. Um, I, I just wrote a book called uh, Thrice Great Hermetica in mm. the Janus Age last year, and part of the book does talk about music, and, and in particular the music of the Baroque era, and even more particularly the music of, of the two great Bachs, uh, Johann Sebastian and Carl Philipp Emanuel. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I point out in the book is if you look at, at the music theory treatises of the 18th century in Germany, they use alchemical terms borrowed directly from alchemy uh. to describe what they're doing in music. Because if you listen to that music, what you have basically are Noam Chomsky's underlying strings that are then endlessly subjected to very specific, formally uh, specifiable procedures of permutations. You know, they turn they turn a motif upside down, they play it backwards, they play it forwards, they speed it up, they slow it down, they chop it apart, recombine it, you know, on and on it goes. Uh, so you've got all this going on, and in addition to this, you've got, you know, it, it's taking place in a multitude of independently moving voices that are making harmonic sense. Wow. So you actually have a cosmological philosophical aesthetic here that's also taking place in that you have a musical representation of individual uh, individual entities or persons or if you will doing their own thing so to speak but doing it in a rational way 
that when combined with others doing it in a rational way makes perfect harmonic sense. You're listening quite literally, it's the way they thought of it, you're listening to the music of the spheres. Of the spheres, right. Well, in effect, isn't aren't you saying that they're that they are engineering the medium through through vibration? It, it yes, sounds to me that's exactly. exactly what you're saying. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Wow. Exactly. That's exactly what they're doing. Uh, you know, it it reaches it reaches extremely subtle, uh, deliberately calculated um, depths. You know, in in the music of the box. Um, oh yeah. I just I just uh, did a vid chat from the members of my website uh, last Friday, and we we were talking a bit. I always get questions from people about music, and and you know what are what are some of the codes that that uh, J S Bach put in his music? So I went uh-huh. and I got my I got my score of his uh, B minor mass, and then I just pointed out some things that you know musicologists tend to overlook. Uh, you know, the et incarnatus uh, from the creed is written in three, four meter. Well, the question is why? Why would this very, this very pious Lutheran be writing that particular piece of music in that time? Is that simply, is that simply uh, caprice, or was this deliberately calculated? Well, the problem is when you're dealing with composers of that era, chances are it's deliberately calculated. Huh. So why three four? Well, Trinity and the four Gospels. Mm-hmm. And then why is the Et Sepultus Est from the Creed written in in three two meter? Well, again, you have second person of the Trinity, and so on and so forth. On and on we could go. Wow. Um, and those those are just those are just the things that you don't really hear except subconsciously. Uh, then you've got you've got what's actually taking place in the music itself and this idea of this baroque idea of the, of the doctrine of the affect because oh. and this is very this is very difficult for the modern to understand because we've been we have been uh following this romanticist aesthetic since the 19th century in the west uh, where the artiste, you know, is is the subjective prophet of his own emotions. Right. And he's trying. He's trying, or she's trying to communicate his or her personal aesthetic and and subjective feelings to to the audience. In the Baroque era, it's, it's very different. The the affect is an objectified emotion. So in other words, again, you strip away analytical overlay. You're not sitting there listening to a piece of music saying, oh, I feel happy, or I think he's happy, or no, you don't do that. What you do is assign a purely symbolic notation to whatever it is that you're feeling, and that in turn becomes the affect. So the composers at that era were quite literally trying to create formulae that would invoke certain emotional responses, not only in the listener, but in the performer, and in the uh, composer, hims- in the composer himself. Right. See. So it's a very it's it's for this reason that that music tends to be kind of impenetrable to the modern uh, Western listener, uh, and for many other reasons as well. But um, all of these things, you know, all of these things again are coming out of this tremendous explosion of hermeticism, which in turn, in my opinion, is coming out of this metaphor. Well, in, in effect, I, I want to ask you this since you are musically inclined. Are these various keys that evoke certain emotions, are this, is this a cultural thing or is this something actually coming out of the vibration? It's coming. Uh, a modern a modern theorist would say, "Well, it's just it's it's just totally uh, random. It, it, there's nothing to keys producing certain affects." A Baroque composer, on the contrary, would say, "Oh no, no, the selection of the key itself is part of the conjuration of a particular affect." Well, that's I mean, you listen to like D minor, and D minor always puts you in kind of a morose mood, or right. Uh, a is always kind of a bright and, and happy sort of key. Happy, right, exactly. Uh, exactly. And, it, and it seems to be, in, uh, above and beyond culture, it seems to be something that uh, oh, definitely. exists in the vibration itself. Yes, definitely, definitely, definitely. 
they they would have said very much the same thing. There are, you know, in other words, there are reasons that uh, Beethoven wrote the Emperor Concerto in the key of E flat. Hmm. There are reasons that uh, Johann Sebastian Bach wrote two of his most famous toccatas in the key of D minor. There are reasons mm -hmm. that Mozart wrote that that twenty uh, first piano concerto in in, in C minor. In C minor, um, yeah. Uh, all of these things are, are very, very uh, definitely a part of the thinking of, of that period. Yeah. Uh, you know, th this 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 period of musical history from um, you know the box Scarlatti, Vivaldi, uh, on up to to early Beethoven is is suffused with this this doctrine. Um, at some point, even you know, even as late as Beethoven, you find you find adumbrations of this doctrine. Wow. You know, most people, most people, you know, it, it astounds me. Most people can sit and listen to the first movement of Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony and not realize that during one major portion of it, they're listening to a fugue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, so, Just kind of sneaking uh, in the back door. He yeah. sneaks it in there, you know. <laughs> so, well, then, you know. <laughs> I mean, and what amazes me is how all this stuff, you know, people would think, well, music can't possibly be related to religion, which can't possibly be related to physics or economics. And yet once you start looking at this topological metaphor, it, it all of a sudden the whole thing just kind of falls together in one big right. quivering mass. Well, it's the, the essence of the metaphor, again, is, is it's analogical in nature. And mm -hmm. that means if you want to look at it yet another way, uh, it's a mapping function in topology from one context to another, and now let's put analytical overlay over the term context. Uh -huh. it's, it's, it's one discipline to another. So in other words, you can detect analogical similarities. This is why Bernstein's lectures are so hugely important, in my opinion, because he he approached the whole thing from, from an analogical point of view, right. trying to point out not only similarities, but discrete and uh, formally specifiable similarities between the functions of natural language and the functions of music, or the rhetorical tropes of, of natural language and similar structures that appear in music. Um, well, you know, I, I can tell very you. Very interdisciplinary. Sure, and and I can tell you from speaking multiple languages, living in a foreign country. Um, one of the hardest things to do is, is one, when you're teaching someone English, to teach them the tonal range that, that transfers as much information as the words do. Right. Uh, and it's when you're learning another language, you, you sound flat to other people because you're unable to get the, the it's almost like a sing song that underrides, uh, like a subcarrier right. wave, you know, that that's underwriting the language and, and carrying all this information with it. Right. And and you know, this is, uh, I guess, pretty much related to what we're what we're on about here. Yes, uh, absolutely. Especially absolutely. with Chomsky, you know, that that's definitely part of his deal. Oh yes, absolutely. The unspoken grammar, but I've already kept you much longer than I promised. Uh, <laughs> But I, I do want to, to plug your website, GizaDeathStar.com, uh, which is fascinating. You do a, an amazing job of analyzing current events and putting them in context. Um, and, and you're one of the few writers I know that are consistently predictive uh, in, in your ability to, to break down current events and, and see where they're going. Uh, and I don't really mean predictive as in, you know, remote viewing but predictive as in, in following the trends um, to their natural their logical conclusion but uh, what else are you working on now I understand you're you're finishing up a book for the publisher where, where is that going yeah I I have a book right now I'm working on called the third way um, the subtitle of it is the Nazi international the European Union and corporate fascism uh, oh wow it's a it's a book that's kind of you know if if your listeners are familiar with my books I, I tend to write my books they're they're all intentionally and deliberately designed to dovetail into each other sure. in kind of a preconceived order but within that 
within the total series of books, I have kind of um, sub-series, uh, certain tracks, if you will, that, that I'm on. And, and one of them has always been um, the Nazi period and, and the Nazi movement. Mm. Um, and so this book is kind of designed as as yet another book in that smaller sub-series of books. It's, uh, it's definitely one of the more... Uh, it's going to be one of the more highly speculative and controversial books that I've written. Well, that's what I love about your writing, though, is <laughs> <laughs> I love a little controversy. It makes you think. Well, there's a lot of controversy in this one. <laughs> well, good. <clears throat> the more, the merrier. <laughs> be warned. Um, there's, there's a highly speculative chapter in this. There's one particularly controversial chapter in it um, and a lot of infamy. Pardon me, a lot of information um, that I knew about way back when I was writing the Nazi International, but uh, which has been six years ago now. Mm -hmm. But uh, I couldn't put this information in that book because I, at the time, I thought, well, this will just be overwhelming if I do, mm -hmm. and it's really out of the temporal context if I do. So. Um, I waited until now to... I had to write certain other books before I wrote this one. That's just kind of the bottom line. Well, and it is, you've said before that your books kind of stand alone, but it sounds like you're kind right. of getting to the point now where you have to build on past arguments in order to, to move forward. Well, yeah. Uh, all the books do that. Um, they all build on, on an overarching, big, huge argument. and uh, But they do, yeah. The books do stand on their own. You can read read them in any order. Uh, you'll quickly discover that they all kind of plug into each other. Mm -hmm. But you can, they all, they're all deliberately designed both to stand on their own and yet be plugged into a much larger series. Well, and, and I, I have to tell you that, that your writing has been absolutely fascinating. It's, it's very much opened my eyes. My, the first one I ever picked up was uh, Cosmic War, and that, that just basically oh, yeah. turned me on my head. Uh, <laughs> it just, I mean, it, it really, all of a sudden it made all these myths and legends come alive, and I think that was one of the most valuable things anyone's ever done for me. Well, thank you. Uh, so I, I highly recommend people read your books. Uh, I, we we have a little group here that we read your stuff and, and discuss it um, on rare occasions, but still we get together and pop a few beers and enjoy uh, having our minds blown. Well, cool. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Believe me, we 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 get about three pages into it and we're off onto all different topics. So it's it's <laughs> very interesting. I, that's what I like to hear. I like people to enjoy them and. and come up with their own ideas and conclusions, you know, they don't have to agree with mine, you know, the more the merrier as far as I'm concerned in this in this attempt to try and reconstruct where we've been and where we're going. Um, just let me add one one thing. Uh, on my website, they, there is a bookstore, so all my books are there mm -hmm. uh, if you want to order them. And I do get a few extra pennies if they order off of my website. I get a few extra pennies from Amazon, so you know uh, I, that's that's the that's the starving artist's plea there. <laughs> so. Well, and, and perfectly understood because I'm one of them too. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, we we uh, we definitely understand that part of it. A few pennies is is you know at least a partial pack of cigarettes. So that's right. <laughs> that's right. But I do want to thank you. It's been absolutely fascinating as usual. Uh, I want to also recommend uh, you. Of course, uh, did I don't know almost a hundred interviews with George Ann Hughes over on the Bite Show dot com. Uh, she's yeah, got a, I think I think it's probably more like fifty, but there's a lot of interviews there. Uh, she passed away, as you know, recently. Just recently, right? Yeah, the son, her son, has kept the website up. As far as I know, he has plans eventually to continue the show. Uh, and do interviews himself. I need, as a matter of fact, to contact him and find out what's going on. But, um, you know, just Google my name. Uh, people can find interviews not only there, but with you, um, with uh, Daniel uh, List at, at Dark Journalist. Uh, mm -hmm. I've, done, I've done some interviews with Whitley Strieber. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just Google my name. You'll find my interviews. You're, you're all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Not in yeah. a bad way either. That's actually uh, it's a it's a wonderful thing because uh, 
the information you have to put out is valuable. And and I don't recommend people, as you say, come at it with a, with a sycophantic sort of attitude. But the brilliant right. part of your writing is that it shows a different way and opens up whole new lines of inquiry uh, that, that people can use to, to figure out their own path. Right. And uh, it's it's very very fascinating your work uh, and well documented and and I really really enjoy it. 